we are going to get right into the Word. First, though, the testimony I received in the mail, it says, <clears throat> Dear J.G. Limiting, thank you kindly for the prayer cloth. It has immediately begun bringing healing and restoration in Jesus' name. Would it be possible to receive another? They got one they want to give away. So, and it gives the address of where to send it to. <clears throat> Here in the near future, well, if you were at the conference, I mentioned what people call prayer clause, and that is one of the areas that we have had <clears throat> just tremendous testimonies of healings. And it's, you know, in Acts 19, it says that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. <clears throat> in that, they would come and take aprons and handkerchiefs from his body, and not his body, not like he was dead, but off of him, okay? And they would uh, send those out, and if a person had demons, they would be delivered, and if they were sick, they'd be healed, all because a cloth came near them, right? And uh, <clears throat> it's really amazing because some of the greatest testimonies and, and healing miracles that we have received have been through prayer cloths and what people call it. It's not really not a prayer cloth. There's nothing in the Bible that says Paul prayed over his clothing or handkerchiefs and aprons and things. We just call it that. It's, I, you know, it's an old Pentecostal term, I guess. Um, <clears throat> maybe not even Pentecostal, just a you know, term uh, from church. But the, one of the, the amazing thing about it, if you want to see, how can I say it, truly miraculous, now, the reason I say that, if you want to see it, prayer clause is one of the best ways to do it because prayer clause prove God's willingness to heal anybody because we have actually sent prayer clause out to people. They would request them or come get them at a meeting or something, and they would put them on themselves, and they would get healed, uh, and then when they went back home, then they would pass them around to other people, and other people would get healed that those clause went to. So there might, well, I, I know of one case where a lady had a brain tumor, and she was part of a uh, support group for people that had cancer and had different types of cancer. And <clears throat> she brought a handkerchief, and we laid our hands on it and just released the life of God as we generally term it, and gave it back to her, and she put it on, got healed, went back to her group, and everybody said, you know, how did this happen? And she, she wore it. It was a couple of days, uh, maybe even a week or so. Uh, and then when she went back to the doctor, the doctor couldn't find anything. So she went back to her support group, told them what had gone on. They're all like, well, how, how did this happen? Well, remember that handkerchief I was wearing? Because her head was, had already been shaved in the whole bit, and uh, she'd lost hair, but then they shaved her head to do some more scans and things. And so she was wearing that handkerchief all the time. And she said, remember that handkerchief? Well, I got that from a preacher over in Dallas. And so she actually... Everybody said, well, where is it at? We want it. And so she brought it out and started passing it around to every person in her group. And eventually, everyone in her group got healed wearing that cloth. And so, now, again, the reason I like that is because that cloth was for her. When we laid hands on it, we intended it to go to her. We weren't intending it to go to other people, but God did. And God is not limited. He's not limited in space and time. He's not limited, you know, really, the only limits he has are the ones we put on him. And so it's amazing, and it's just, it just goes to show. Prayer claws are similar. I would almost say they're like a modern pool of Bethesda, that you, but you can pass it around. It's not where you have to go to it. You can actually bring it to you. And so that's why I say if you really want to see the truly miraculous, get a prayer cloth, Pass it around, give it to different people, and watch what God does. It, it's just amazing. So anyway, <clears throat> now, let's see. I got all my things right here. We're going to do some things today. We mentioned this a little bit earlier about how important it is to identify with Christ. And so this morning, you know, J.J. Lynn, we're known for showing you how, not just telling you this is what you need to do, this is what you should do, but to actually show you how. And so that's what we want to do today. We want to show you how to identify with Christ because Every area you identify with Christ in, you take on his life for that area. And his life and his nature is released into your life through your identifying with him. And so today we want to talk about that a little bit. So I brought this out, <clears throat> and we'll be 
looking at some things, and I'll be writing some things up. But first, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 1 says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Notice, how do you get grace and peace multiplied to you? Through knowledge. Do you hear that? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath, means what? Past tense, already done it, right? Hath <clears throat> given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Now, that one verse, remember last week we talked about the best faith, biggest faith, greatest faith, is to take a, the broadest general promise and apply it to your specific problem. Isn't that right? And so this is that broad general promise that according as he has already given unto us, everything that pertains to life and godliness. So now think, if God has already given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, if he has already blessed us, Ephesians 1, 3, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, what is there left to give you? Anything? No. So there is nothing more for God to do for you to have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Is that right? So, in other words, it's already been given. <clears throat> okay? Uh, you should have got your that little notification in your spirit that says your package is in the mail. It's, <laughs> it's being transferred. It's being, you know, and they give you the updates along the way. Well, the Bible does that too, right? And you ought to know that these things have already been sent. It's just up to us to receive. That's the key. How do you receive? By believing. What is believing? Well, if you're here this morning, you know that believing is actually consciously holding a position, right, with confirmation by, or which is confirmed by, corresponding actions. So that means if you have received by believing, then that means you have to act like you have received. Isn't that right? Which means if you, well, <laughs> You know, it's kind of funny because I, I can't use some of the illustrations I used uh, really years ago, even back in the 80s and 90s. You know, back then we had these huge <laughs> stereo systems. I mean, big. You remember the big stereos? And you'd get the big speakers. And I mean, that, it was just huge. It's like you needed a room just for that, right? And it's funny because the illustration I used to use was, okay, for instance, if you, want, if you needed a stereo system, and you were going to get it by faith, and you had to believe that you received it, so that means you had to go make room for that. You ever, you've heard this, right? You go clear out your space, because as soon as it arrives, you're going to stick it into that spot. So if you're not cleaning out a space, you don't really think it's on its way. So the corresponding action is to clear out a space perfectly fitted for that stereo system. Well, nowadays, you, know, you need a phone. That's, that doesn't take much space anymore, right? But... The whole, whole idea is that there has to be a corresponding action. So if you're going to identify with Christ, and we're going to talk about how to do that and what it means to do that, you're also going to have to have corresponding action of your identification, right? So I'm just going to wrap some of these things up real quick. I'll see if I can do this. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I will figure it out. There we go. Okay. I don't want to it back too far. All right. You know what? I should have... Chose a volunteer, <laughs> somebody that can write good. <clears throat> I write quick, generally. Okay, so we're going to look at, there are two categories. How do I want to do this? I really didn't think this through. Okay, I'm sorry? Hmm? Uh, well, yeah, I could do that. Well, I only write with one hand, though, so I'm good. <laughs> that you can read, anyway. So I write with the other hand, you can't read it. Okay, so we have, let's say, we'll do here. We'll just do this one. This is going to be Adam. And then over here, we will say this will be in whoop, Christ. Okay? Now, notice two categories. You can find this really 
in John 10.10, 10, right? <clears throat> John 10.10, because 10, everything over here is Adam, but it's Satan's nature. Now remember, sin, S, well, don't know where to do this now. <laughs> we'll do it here first. Sin, S-I-N, okay? This means this is Satan's intrinsic nature. You get it? This is who he is, right? So he's trying to get you to do this, right? And now in Adam, I guess I should have done this side. In Adam, it would have been here, right? So in Adam, you have sin. John 10, 10, we know what the difference between these two are. If you're living over in Adam, you're living under Satan's rule, so to speak, then you are being, well, stolen from, killed, and destroyed. If you're in Christ, you have life, and you have it more abundantly. Amen? Isn't that simple? So <clears throat> let's look at a couple of things. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so what do we have in Adam? Well, one of the first things is we have death. Boo, death, right? Okay, so, all, right now, all right, now, over here, of course, we have life. Yay, all right, okay. <clears throat> Going to have to raise the dead here? Yeah, that's right. Okay, 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 yeah. Over here, okay, we've got cursing, right? There you go, you're catching on, okay. And over here... We have blessing. Yay. There we go. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> now, over here, we have... There, you already know. Look at it. It's starting already. Boo, don't even know what I'm writing yet. But, it's, but you know it's on this side, so we don't want it, right? So, and now, this, of course, would go along with death. But sickness would go along with death, or we could even say disease, right? It would all be over there. Over here, we have healing... There you go. And health. Amen. The only thing better than healing is health. Amen? All right. Over here, we have poverty, also known as lack. Okay, there you go. And over here, we have prosperity. Remember, you get it to the degree you, you yeah. know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> And abundant. Yeah! There you go. There you go. All right. Now, then over here we have sin. Isn't that right? And what is normally known as unrighteousness. There we go. And over here we have righteousness. There we go. Now, again over here. And this is not a uh, conclusive or, a, or total list, but it's enough to get you started. You have fear. And over here, you actually have love. You say, well, well, shouldn't faith be there? No, 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 see, perfect love casts out fear. The opposite of fear is love. See, if you're in fear, it's because you don't know God's love. If you understand God's love, you won't walk in fear. Amen? Now, then you have... The other aspect, we have doubt, unbelief, and here you have what? Faith. There you go. Now, then we have mental anguish, right? Horrible, okay? And then we have peace. Yay. Amen? Now, most of these, you know, for instance, this was purchased for us in the garden. Remember when Jesus sweat, dropped the blood? Because he went through the mental anguish that if we don't have his peace, we will have that. If we have this, we don't have this, right? If we have this, we don't have this. If we have this, we don't have this. You see the picture, right? So all of these, now notice these are in Christ. In him, right? Not just by him, but in him. Then over here, all of this is in Adam, right? Now, this is the way you're born. <clears throat> Everybody is born in this. Everybody comes through this, you might say. Everybody is born wrong, okay? <clears throat> but you get born again right. Amen? Yeah. Okay, now, let's look at this a bit further. <clears throat> in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, it says in verse 3, we just began it, but he says, according as his divine power hath, past tense, 
given unto us all things, all things, right, on this side, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. By which, by which what, okay? <clears throat> by the knowledge of him, okay? By which and by his divine power are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these, by these what? these exceeding great and precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Why? Because over here, you had Satan's nature, right? Over here, you have God's nature, okay? Let me just go ahead. Yeah, whatever, that's good. That'll work. Okay. Now, <clears throat> he says... By, yeah, by which are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now notice what he says. If you are a partaker of the divine nature, you having escaped the corruption, the degeneration, the degrading, the falling apart, the dissolving, the, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of other words that go along with that, that is in the world through lust. Because that's what it came from and that's what it leads to. Now, and besides this, verse 5, Giving all diligence, that means being studious. It means being uh, aggressive toward it, all right? Giving all diligence. <clears throat> Add to your faith virtue. Now, that's not saying you don't have virtue, okay? He's saying, but you add to this, you develop it because it's there. It's very similar to what God told Adam to tend or to keep the garden. Remember what he told him there? To tend or keep the garden was to give diligence in making sure that things kept moving the way they're supposed to. So here it says to add to our faith, our, uh, yeah, faith virtue, <clears throat> and to virtue, knowledge. Now notice to each one of these things, it's like building blocks, and we can actually list them out. Now, he says this, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity or love, as we know. For if these things be in you and abound. Now that's why he's saying <clears throat> that you have them and that you are to be diligent to add more to it. In other words, to increase, all right? If, they, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Notice, if you're not barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that means that everything that you know about him will be in your life. Do you get that? His nature will be in your life. Now, notice how all these things are tied together. You have knowledge, you have these uh, character traits or nature traits, but it also says <clears throat> that by these precious promises. So we know all of these are promises that are given to us, but we have to have them living in us. Now, we know that we are born again complete because we are complete in him. So these things are in us, but now we are to grow them and to have them added and increase in us. If we have that in us, then <clears throat> at that point, we will have in us the nature of Christ, the nature of God, and we'll be partakers of his divine nature. Now, <clears throat> all that means is you're going to start walking and talking like God would walk and talk. Well, if you, people say, oh, you can't do that. Well, wait a minute. Jesus did, and he's our example. So we're supposed to walk and talk like he did, and he walked and talked like God walked and talked. Amen? So we're supposed to, and all that, all this means is simply this. Agree with what God has said. That's all it means. And even the idea of confessing the scriptures and confessing different things, all that means is just agree with what God has already said. So if God has already said that he has already blessed us with all every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, then all we have to do is agree with that. Amen? <clears throat> now, by these precious promises, we can find out what those promises are, what those blessings are, and then we can start to get them into our life. Now, <clears throat> move on. Let's, let's read the rest. He says uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, just to make sure you know, by these exceeding great and precious promises, right? We just read. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, 
who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Right? Now, notice, he said, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached by us to you. And he, then he said, who us is, right? Paul and Savannah and Timothy, as we know. <clears throat> and he said, and this Jesus, Christ, this Jesus Christ, the Son of God that we preach to you, he was not yes and no. He was yes. Do you, do you see that? Now, I'm just reading it. I mean, it's King James, but I'm just basically interpreting it. But now notice, <clears throat> look at verse 20. How do we know this? For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, which means what? So be it, right? Un now notice this last part. See, people forget this. Unto the glory of God by us. When we believe his promises and we take his promises and we become a partaker of his divine nature, we bring glory to God by us doing that. See, the problem has been, okay, religion, dead religion I'm talking about. I'm not talking about true, pure, undefiled religion that James talks about. Dead religion will always keep you a pauper. It'll always keep you down. It'll always keep you uh, lacking because it wants to keep you dependent on it. Do you understand? It will always keep you down. It'll always say you're no good. You can never be any good. You can never do anything. You can't change. You can't. And then it'll turn around and it'll read scriptures that tell you that you're different that you were recreated. It'll tell you all these things, but it'll always put it off till over there, somewhere over there. Over there is not when you need to be righteous. You need to be righteous here so you can get there. Because if you ain't righteous, you ain't getting there. Amen? So he tells us, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take my nature, my characteristics, and I've given you promises that show you how and what I am, God's saying, and as you believe my promises, you're going to see my nature worked out in you. And therefore, that will bring glory to me because other people are going to see you because your light's going to shine. And that light is him. And as his light shines in us, then they will see him in us and it will reflect God. Amen? Now, we know that they gave us, uh, God gave us himself in the sense that he gave us all of his names, all the Jehovahistic names, which were covenant names, which is simply him telling us what he wants to be to us and how he wants the world to see him through our life. So if he's Jehovah Jireh, that he wants the world through these promises, we take these promises and say, you said that you would meet all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I thank you for it. And then you identify with that promise with that nature of God, because it's his nature to give. We know that. Why? Because God so loved that he gave, right? And that he gave him while we were still sinners. He gave Jesus to die for us. And that was before we did anything right, right? So the nature of God, God wants his nature exhibited through our life. And that's every individual person's life. That's not this special person or that special person. No, every individual Christian, God wants his nature seen in their life. So you can really know what his nature is by looking just at, even just at the Jehovahistic names, right? And there's different numbers depending on who you want to believe. Uh, but we know there's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Are there promises that promise that he will meet our needs? Yeah, Philippians 4.19, of course. And then, of course, if you go back into Matthew, 633, he tells us, your heavenly father knows that you have need of these things, right? And there he says, you don't even have to ask for them. He's going to provide them, right? But now look at this. You go and you look at, uh, well, for instance, then you've got Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's another nature. See, that's the thing that people don't get. Healing and being a healer is God's nature. That's his first response. That's his first, if he sees sickness, his first response is to heal. Now, Unfortunately, now he either has to get that person to come to him or he has to get his people to go to them. That makes sense? Why? Because he's not here in the flesh to touch them, so he needs somebody here that can touch them or he needs them to actually invite him in personally to do that, but then they got to know what he's like. And if they go to church most of the time and get dead religion, 
then they're not going to think that, he's, that his first response to sickness is healing. They're going to think his first response, that the sickness was his first response, and he made you sick so that he can teach you something, so that he can make you a better person or something like that. And we need to realize his nature is to heal. Now, your nature is what you are prone to do. Isn't that right? If you say that person's generous, what does that mean? That means they are prone to, to giving, to helping, to doing, isn't that right? Well, that person is, is hospitable. That means they're prone to being hospitable, right? So anything a person is, that's what they're prone to do. So if God is Jehovah Rapha, he's prone to healing. He is toward healing. That's his first response to, a, to any type of problem. If you're a parent and your child hurts themselves, your first response is not usually, okay, no, I mean, I understand there's circumstances, okay, <clears throat> but, you know, and sometimes that I told you so wants to just kind of come out, right? <clears throat> told you not to run with that, didn't I? You know, you have that. But if you're a parent and they're hurting, bleeding or something like that, your first response is help them. Right. Isn't that right? Your first response is not to turn it into a lesson. That comes afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, isn't that right? I mean, yeah. if at all, it comes afterwards, right? Right then, you're trying to alleviate pain. You're trying to help them. That's God. And see, that's the spirit of God in a person, in the parent, doing that and wanting to help first, right? Now, so if we look at this, now every one of these we could attach God's nature to, right? Because this is not just what he did. This is who he is. He is life, isn't that right? He is the blesser. Why? Because he is the giver, Jehovah, Rapha, uh, Jehovah Jireh, isn't that right? He is Jehovah Sikhanu, the Lord, our righteousness, right? So he is all of these things. God is love, isn't that right? So these are aspects of his nature. So these are just some. Now, this isn't all. There are, you know, a lot of promises in the Bible. And each one, for a different case, and, and there are certain numbers I can't quote, the numbers that just apply to Christians because there are promises made to individuals that are not made to Christians necessarily. Right? Just because of certain, I'm talking about Old Testament more than New Testament. But so notice here in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 For God is not unrighteous, therefore he will not forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister or serve. Right? And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, lazy, slow-moving, but followers of them who, through faith and patience, faith and consistency, would be a good way to say it, inherit the promises. Now, remember, promises plural, not promise singular. Through faith and patience, you inherit inherit. Do you get that? What do you inherit from your parents, usually from a natural standpoint? Genetics, right? To a degree. Now, I'm talking about from the natural. Now, in the spiritual, of course, we can offset that, but I'm just saying, notice he says inherit. So when he talks about this is how we inherit the promises, then that means that we are getting promises from him. But now notice how are we partakers of his divine nature and of these promises? By these precious promises, we go to these promises, and we say, oh, there's a promise. Here's what he said he would do. Here's what he wants to work out in my life. This, now notice, if God wants to meet your needs because it's in his nature to meet needs, then that nature, he's going to work that nature in you through a promise. So if he promises to meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus... Philippians 4.19. If he promises, according to Matthew 6.33, that seek first the kingdom and all these other things will be added to you. These things will be added to you. Is that right? That's the nature, and you get his nature by these promises. So if you put these promises into your life and it's going to work out his nature, that means that if he gave, you're going to give because that's his nature. Do you get that? Yes, so we can't be thinking, uh, take in and just take in. We have to be thinking, okay, if I want the nature of God, he so loved that he gave. 
So I'm going to have to sow love that I give. In other words, just like we were talking about this morning, faith, believing, will always have a corresponding action. So if you believe that God loves you, and therefore you have faith in him to meet your needs, then the best way to have corresponding action with it is to find people with needs and meet their needs. When you meet their needs, now, I'm not saying that God won't meet your need until you meet others' needs. I'm not saying that, right? What I'm saying is this, that when you start meeting the needs of others, then you are taking on God's nature. When you take on God's nature, guess what else his nature is? Absolute abundance, no lack. He never, th- he doesn't even think lack, right? He thinks, what do you need? And if you start thinking along those lines, you quit thinking, I need this, I don't have that, what do I not have? Well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to start a business. Okay, well, that's good. Well, what do you need to start the business? Well, I can't start the business. Well, you just said you want to start a business. Yeah, but I can't. Why? Well, you know, I don't have the education for it. I don't have the money for it. I don't, I don't even know. I don't even have a, a building for it. I mean, I just, I just can't start a business. Okay, you just told me everything you don't have. Now let's look at the other side. See, this, this is the, okay. You just told me what you don't have. So that means that's in, in Adam, right? But that's not you. See, you are over here. So you have abundance. Now, you say, well, yeah, but Kurt, come on, let's be real. I don't have abundance. That's why I want to start the business. I want to, I want to have abundance, but I don't have abundance. No, no, no. You have abundance, but, you, but it's not seen in your life yet because it's still a promise. But the promise will become reality once you take the promise and by faith and patience inherit the promise, and that promise is his nature. Do you see that? God's promises were not things. Number one, it was him. Now, he blesses us, and he can bless you with things. And that's as long as it, you know, well... He'll bless you with things as long as you own the things and the things don't own you, right? And, and so we need to realize because the Bible says that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and adds no sorrow. Amen? So that you, you look at some rich people. You can tell if somebody got their riches by God or by the world. Because yeah. if they got it by God, there's no sorrow added with it. But if they get it by the world, they'll be worried about it, trying to keep it, trying to hold on to it, thinking everybody's trying to take it away from them and trying to figure out how I can pile up more when they've already got more they can use anyway. That's, it adds sorrow to it. But when you take God's nature, then you realize that it's not how much you save up, but you become a conduit, and it's how much you can let literally uh, the wealth of heaven, if you want to use that term, and I know I'm going to get letters and all kinds of stuff from people. But if you, in other words, if you want to let the nature of God flow through you, then you're not going to think in terms of lack or I don't have this or I don't have that. See, that's, that's one of the things here. I have here, now think about this. Now, we don't have, you know, money stacked up in the sense of that, uh, you know, we're looking for somewhere to spend it. You understand? I'm talking about the ministry and that kind of thing. Now, listen, whatever we need, we don't make decisions based on money. We find out what God's will is, and then we make that decision, then we head that direction. And we don't check according to what's in the bank to determine what we're going to do. We find out from God, and when we find out from God what he wants us to do, we head that direction, knowing that every step along the way, when we need finances or things or whatever it is, it will be there. We don't wait till we save it all up and then move on it. We move toward it, and it's paid out as it goes as we need it, right? Now, and everybody like here at staff, see, that's the thing. (laughs) It's funny because I have... I've never yet, okay, no one on staff that's ever came to me and said, we need to buy this. I've never said, oh, we can't afford that. We, that no, no staff member, they're all sitting right here. No staff member has ever heard that come out of my mouth. You know. Now, what I will tell them is, and, and they'll say, uh, we need this, we need that. They tell me the thing. Okay. I have no idea what it costs. So what do I tell them? My answer is always the same. Give me a number. Give me a number. And, and no, nothing they have ever asked for, okay, if it advances the kingdom, if it makes things even more efficient, I'm for it. God's for it. So if somebody asks me for something and, you know, they want me to release it, which a lot of times they don't even have to come to me for that, but if they want me to release those finances or whatever, they, a lot of them don't even know what we have or what we don't have. But as far as they know, we got it. Why? Because I've never turned them down. Not one person has ever asked me for money to do anything needs to be done and I said, we don't have the money, we can't do it, not once. So why? 
because we may not have it on hand, but if we need that thing, we will have that thing because God will provide the finances or the thing itself. One of the two. Amen? So the key is just understanding that all I need is a number. You give me a number, we'll move on it, right? If they even have to ask me, like I said, most of the time they don't even have to ask me. So <clears throat> the whole idea, though, is we don't, I don't have a poverty mindset. Now, that doesn't mean I'm rich by any stretch, right? But I'm rich in faith, which means whatever I need, I can get. Why? Because I know God's love for me. See, if you don't know God's love, if you think that everything you're going to get is just by this, in other words, if I can get enough faith, I can get whatever I want. You're always going to have a problem wondering if you have enough faith. Right? But if you know this, God's love for you, because here's the other thing. You say, well, I got faith. Okay, I got faith. Oh, but man, yesterday I messed up. So I got to kind of work my way back. I got to do, see, that's how people think, is I got to work my way back up to God's good grace, right? Rather than just repent and go, God, I'm sorry. This is where I messed up. Sorry, you know, cleanse. Let's start again. Let's go. And, and then you kick right back up. Now, so if you're focused on here, understand faith is important. No doubt about it. But if your faith is in your faith, your faith will fail you. But if your faith is in God's love, then you'll know that even if you mess up, he still loves you. He might not approve of what you did. He doesn't condone what you did. He may not back up what you did, but because he loves you, he still, he's not going to not feed you. You understand? He, he doesn't send you to your room without food as punishment, right? That's only humans, right? That's what we do sometimes. But God loves us, right? And even his overwhelming love often draws us to repentance, have you ever messed up? Don't have to raise your hand. I'm just saying. Have you ever messed up? And I mean it right after that, God does something amazing for you. It, and it, now think about it. How does that make you feel? Because right then you're, you're like, oh, God, you're so amazing. You know, because you know you don't do it because it's like, God, I don't even look there. Just they're over here, God. Just don't even look at what I did. But thank, and I know you're not because look what you're doing. You ever notice how he will bless you? He's not blessing you for messing up. He's blessing you because he loves you, right? And, and, and his goodness will draw you to repentance. Why? And it's amazing sometimes how that's timed so perfectly that it just takes you to your knees and you just have to worship. Amen? And so, because he's that good. But if you understand his love, then you know that he's going to meet your needs. That even if you don't, you know, okay, the word for sin literally means to miss the mark. Okay, to miss the target, to miss the bullseye, to miss the target. So any sin is missing the target. So, you know, <laughs> missed by an inch, missed by a mile. It really doesn't matter. It's not like darts where they have different levels. Okay, oh, I, oh, I missed it. I just missed it a little bit, so I get 90% of God's blessing. You know, oh, man I, man, I was completely off the dart board. I ain't getting nothing, right? That's not how God does things. Now, I'm not saying that he blesses disobedience, but I'm saying he will keep you and move you toward obedience, and he's not uh, vengeful in the way that he's just looking for a reason to hold back. He's looking for a way to get his blessings to you. Why? Because his blessings come in the form of promises that, come, that deliver his nature, and he wants his nature in you. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So now watch. <clears throat> watch this. Uh, in... In verse 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. <clears throat> For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. Now notice, <clears throat> he swore to him, he swore against himself or on himself. He didn't swear on Abraham's goodness or even technically on his total obedience because Abraham still messed up. How many of you know Abraham messed up even after he received the promise, yes. right? I mean, it's amazing. He's the father of faith, and yet you can't name on one hand all his mistakes. He made quite a few, actually, and big ones. I'm not talking about little ones. I'm talking about big ones, right? Uh, his first big mistake was Ishmael. Is that right? 
son after the flesh, not after the spirit. Yeah? He wasn't the promised child. Is, is that right? Now, and then he even lied. Abraham lied. Here he is a prophet lying about his wife being his sister. And then, you know, a, a heathen king uh, takes her in to become one of his concubines, basically. And God has to intervene and go, uh, you're a dead man. And the, the heathen king, get this, God is talking to a heathen king. He isn't talking to a spirit-filled, tongue-talking believer. And yet you got spirit-filled, tongue-talking believers. I can't hear God's voice. Well, a heathen king could hear his voice. Yes. Amen? He said, my sheep know my voice, and the voice of another they won't listen to. Right. So really what you have to find out is, whose sheep are you? Come on. Just say it. Yes. All right? Anyway, okay, let's, keep, let's keep going. <laughs> Now, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice the word hath. Hath not gonna. Amen? That means it's already done. It's already released. It has been sent. It just has not been received yet. Amen? <clears throat> then he says, according. Now, in other words, how did he bless us? Well, his blessing is according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated, past tense, us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, <clears throat> according to the good pleasure of his will. Now notice, I want you to think about this. Remember the two sides, in Adam, in Christ, okay? We were orphans. Isn't that right? Not technically. I mean, we had a father called the devil. In some cases, it's better to be an orphan. But anyway, uh, we had a father. But now we have what? We have received what? Adoption into God's family. We've been translated out of the authority of darkness, out of the power of darkness, into the kingdom of God's dear son. Is that right? Transferred, translated, moved from one place to another. That means the other place has no authority in your life whatsoever. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> to the praise, now watch, he adopted us according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. He adopted us while we were bad, while we were not good, right? <clears throat> to the praise of the glory of his grace, showing how great his grace is that he allowed us to come in, right? Wherein he hath, past tense, made us, past tense, accepted in the beloved. Do you hear that? So now, so we could even put over here, we could put accepted, and over here, we would have to put rejected. Is that right? So if you feel rejection, you're still operating under Adam. If you're dealing with rejection, you're operating under Adam. Why? Because if, if you're born again, you have been accepted by God. And if you've been accepted by God, who cares who rejected you? Amen? Well, <clears throat> I just found out I was adopted. And I don't know who my birth parents were. And I just feel, and how old are you? I'm 45. And you're feeling rejected now because somebody put you, no, you, but you were adopted, right? Yeah, I was adopted. Then somebody loved you more than somebody rejected you. Amen. And I can tell you, God accepted you more than the devil rejected you. Amen? Amen? So if you are dealing in rejection, you need to realize you're no longer in Adam. Now you are in Christ. Amen. And in Christ, you have been made accepted in the brethren. Amen? Amen? Well, I go around my family, you know, and it's just... Then get away from them. <laughs> why, why do you want to go back there when all they do is put you down, cut you down, talk about you, whatever it is. <clears throat> Instead, hang out with people that love you. Why? Where, where is your acceptance? In the beloved, in the brethren. Yeah. Get around believers. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You say, well, I've been around some church people, and all they do is reject. Church people, not believers. Right. There's a difference. There's a difference between being a church member and being a member in the body of Christ. Yeah. And you can show it by how you treat people. Amen? Word. And so just understand you're accepted. Keep, listen, if you can't find your acceptance, keep looking for the group that, that shows you acceptance. Amen? You know, now, well, that's a whole other thing. I don't want to get off into it too far. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm just saying, do you realize this is how, here we go. Okay. So <laughs> do you realize this is how cults grow? Oh. I got a witness. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Is this right? This is how, do you know right now while we are sitting here, there has probably been a Jehovah witness knocking on your door at home. Why? Because they prey on people that don't go to church. Because they know the people that stay at home aren't in a body. And it's the, <laughs> it's the lone banana that gets eaten. <laughs> you know I mean? If you notice, see, that's how the enemy does. He will separate you from the flock. He'll make you feel abandoned. He'll make you feel rejected. He'll make you feel uh, isolated. And then he'll send somebody after you to finish you off. Because remember, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro upon the face of the earth, looking for those in whom he can show himself strong. Well, guess what? The devil is also looking for people. It says that he goes about looking as a roaring lion, looking for those that he can devour. And let me tell you, when you're alone, isolated, cut off, and feeling sorry for yourself, you are easy to devour. This is why he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because if you stay home, I'm not, t I'm, listen, I'm not telling you church is going to save you. Jesus Christ saves you. Amen? Amen. But I'm telling you that if you stay home and forsake the assembling of yourselves together, there will be somebody knocking on your door. You're going to feel like you have to open it, and somebody's going to be there to tell you about Jehovah's kingdom, and they're going to start talking to you, and they're going to, and they're going to love you, right? But it's a false love. Why? Because it is satanic. Because the point, they don't love you for you. They love you to get you in to their group. And if you reject that, they won't love you. That's the way it works. And, and unfortunately, some Christians are that way too, or at least professing Christians, yeah. right? <clears throat> but you have to realize that that's what they do. They, and that, okay, listen, cults and gangs work the same way. They, they take people who, and they, they look for, listen, the devil goes about looking for people he can devour. He's looking for that child that feels a little different. It feels a little off, feels a little separated, feels a little rejected, feels a little bullied or whatever it is. And then that gang will bring them in and say, listen, we'll love it. We'll, we'll be the family that you've been looking for. All you have to do is prove that you love us too. Here's this gun. Yeah. Go shoot this person. Go do this. Go rob this. Go steal that. And that's your initiation. And then you're in and you will never get out because we won't let you out. They don't tell you how they won't let you out. But then they, but they have this idea and you have a, a, a fellowship there among them, and, but it's a false love, but it's the only love you know if you haven't received love from somebody else. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, <laughs> that's a whole, I can take off on that too. Anyway, um, 57,000 yesterday at Trump's. Yeah. You remember that? 57,000. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, anyway. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, the letters I'm going to get. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> let's get back in it. Now, notice to the praise of his glory, this is in verse 6, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom. We have redemption. So what do we got? We got redemption over here. Isn't that right? Yes. So if we have redemption over here, what do we have over there? Rejection. Yeah. You know, okay. Uh, bought into, we could say we're sold into slavery because that's what redemption is, is being brought or bought out of slavery. Okay. Now watch, he says here, having, let me get it the right place. There we go. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace wherein he hath abounded toward us, abounded in all wisdom and prudence. Now notice, so in him, we, in Christ, we have wisdom. So in Adam, we have ignorance, because that's what he actually said. He said that back when we were in our ignorance, we did not recognize God, right? And he winked at ignorance in, in past times, but now he has revealed Christ to us. So now watch, he says in verse, uh, yeah, yeah having made known unto us, verse 9, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. So now notice, it is his good pleasure to bring us 
the knowledge of the mystery of his will. So we are not to be unwise, but wise knowing the will of God. Do you hear that? So we know the mystery of his will in Christ. In Adam, we are unknowing, unwise. Isn't that right? Amen. Okay, I'm just showing you. So I'm, I'm showing you the difference in how, then I'm going to show you actually how to bring this into your life, okay, to work it out. Amen. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom? Also, we have obtained, past tense, an inheritance, being predestinated, past tense, according to the purpose of him that works all things after the counsel of his own will. In other words, he knows what to do, and he knows how to do it, and he's going to do what he decides is right. Okay? Now, what that means is we have an inheritance. But if we don't have it in, in Christ, we have an inheritance. But in Adam, we, have, we are destitute. We are without hope. Isn't that right? Now... In that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest down payment, we might say, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So now we have the Holy Spirit within us until we are fully and totally redeemed to the consummation, till we are glorified spirit, soul, and body. And now, and if that change, then there will, we will have no more need to change because we will have been completely, totally redeemed, right? Now we have been redeemed, we are being redeemed, and we shall be redeemed. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. Do, do you get the idea there, right? Now, so... <clears throat> yes, okay. In verse, uh, let's see, 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now notice, in Christ, your eyes are enlightened, but under Adam, they were darkened, and your knowledge was darkened. Amen? Okay, now listen carefully. Anything in the Bible that mentions darkness is always evil. Isn't that right? So everything. So we have to understand, God is light. With God, our future is bright. When we say, I mean, come on. The path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter into the perfect day. Is that right? So we have to realize, so everything good is light, and whatever is bad, according to Scripture, is darkness. Amen? Amen? Okay. So then he says in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Knowledge of him. Notice wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What does that mean? That means that you understand and you know what is in Christ, because this is your inheritance, which is what he's talking about. Because he says here, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I keep emphasizing that because I want you to realize the wisdom and revelation that you need is not wisdom and revelation about end times or what's happening next. I'm not saying that we can't know or shouldn't know. I'm just saying here we are promised wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ a more of a fullness. Why? Because he was the perfect revealing of the nature of God and the character of God, right? Now watch. <clears throat> then he says in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. So here's what this enlightenment will bring, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Why? Because his calling is your calling. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. And what are, we could say are, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Do you understand his, the, the inheritance that Jesus received by being raised from the dead is in the saints? Do you get that? His inheritance is in you. What does that mean? That means that everything he inherited is in you, and now because we're in him, we inherit these same things, which is the nature and character and blessings of God. Amen? Amen. This is reality. This is who you really are. 
Because if you drop dead right now, if your spirit left your body, your body would be dead and you would go be with God and you would not have to change one bit to step into God's presence directly in front of him. Why? Because in the spirit, you have been recreated, you have been justified, you've been regenerated. Everything that needs to be done in the spirit has been done. Now, all you need to do is work on your soul and your actions. That's why he tells us have our mind renewed to the word of God and tells that we are to raise up holy hands. Isn't that right? That we are to do what? Present our bodies a living sacrifice. Amen? Amen. Now, he says, uh, and what is, yeah, verse 19, and what is, he wants us to know, okay, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So he wants to know, he wants us to know this exceeding power that he has released toward us on our behalf. And he wants to do it. And notice, and it's going to be according to the working of his power. Yeah. That's why he tells us to be, for us to be strong in his power. Amen? Not in our own strength. How much power is this? Verse 20 tells us. This is the power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So what does that mean? That means that we have resurrection. We don't have death. We have resurrection. Amen? Far. Now, where are we seated? We are seated far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. <clears throat> now, it, let's say you... Let's say somebody is sending you something you don't want, right? They called you and said, hey, I'm sending you that special fruitcake. <laughs> I'm sending it to you. It's come to you, but you don't want it. So what do you do? You don't answer the door. Maybe you go on a trip. You don't even want to be there, right? You're, you don't even, okay. It could be something more than a fruitcake, all right? But whatever it is, you don't want it. <clears throat> now, you have to understand that whenever... He, we were raised and seated with him in heavenly places. We are above all power, principality, all these dominions, all this that we're above that. Isn't that right? We're also seated above every name that is named. Not only in this world. You get that? But also in that which is to come. Now, so that's two worlds, this world and the world that is to come. And we are above every name that's in any one of those worlds, either one of those worlds. Is that right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> what does that mean? Okay, so give me a name of something here that you don't want. Top 10 answer, okay? <laughs> Survey says? Okay, no, I know what I can say. <clears throat> okay. What was it? Sickness. Was it? Huh? Cancer. Sickness. Cancer, sickness, there you go. That's a name. Okay. And you're above that. Right. So if you're above it, you're not below it. Right. right? So if you're above it, it can't touch you. Right. Right. But you can touch it. And make it flee. Amen. Amen? Yeah. But you're seated above it. So if you're seated above something, okay, there are people that are in degrees of power that literally can't be touched. Hey. <laughs> is that right? I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying it is, that, okay. I mean, I'm saying that there are people, there are people, for instance, okay, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> If you, many times if you're in the government and you're like an ambassador or you're in another country on governmental or diplomatic basis, you have what is called diplomatic immunity, which means now for minor things, technically, uh, you, you know, you can't get a speeding ticket. You can't get a parking ticket. You can't do things like that. And it actually goes up pretty high. I mean, it's a pretty high level. <clears throat> but for the most part, because you have diplomatic immunity, why? Because you're above that. Now, we don't like the idea of anybody being above the law, but there was a reason for making that so, so that bad countries couldn't uh, hassle or harass uh, diplomats going in there and just bog them down or arrest them for, for small things. You have to realize that we are ambassadors. Right. And because of that, we have diplomatic immunity. And that diplomatic immunity means that anything below us, we do not have to answer to. Do you get that? Okay. Anything that has a name that is of this world system in the sense of sickness, disease, poverty, these things that are spiritual enemies, we do not have to answer to or allow them in our life. We have diplomatic immunity because we are seated far above them. Does that make sense? So that thing, once you realize that thing can't touch, it's amazing. If you, don't, if, if you don't know that you can't be touched, 
you still have fear of being touched. But once you know that you can't be touched, it's amazing how bold you'll get. Right? I mean, you know, you look at it, you go to a zoo, and they got the gorilla cage, right? And the old days, they had these bars, you know? But you could get up there near it. I mean, the gorilla could get there, but he couldn't really get through it. But he could, you could touch his fingers. I mean, he, you know, it was close enough, right? But now they made it where it's just glass, a glass enclosure or it's way down and they can't get to it. And it's amazing how bold people got. Because when that gorilla would come up to that fence, uh, people would step back, you know, because you, you just wasn't too sure. <clears throat> but when they put that glass up there and they knew that thing couldn't get through, man, they'll go up there and make faces at it and do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, and then the gorillas get smart and start throwing things at you. Anyway, that's... <laughs> you can find that on the internet. If <clears throat> monkeys throwing stuff at people. I'm just saying. <clears throat> but it's amazing how bold you will get if you know the enemy can't touch you. And yet the Bible says we are to have boldness. Isn't that right? Why? Because the righteous are as bold as a lion. What lion? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> notice here in verse uh, 21, uh, 22, sorry. It says, <clears throat> not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath, past tense, put all things under his feet, which is your feet, because you're his body, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You see, you are the full. The Bible says that all the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus bodily. Isn't that right? And now we are his body. So all the fullness of God now dwells in us because we are his body. His physical body left here, and he sent back his spirit, and the spirit of God now fills us so that all the fullness of God is in us because we are his body. You got it? And that means if we're his body, then under our feet is everything that's under his feet. Amen? Amen? Now, in uh, Romans 16, verse 20, it says that, and the very God of peace shall bruise, crush Satan under your feet shortly. Isn't that right? So that shows that, he is to, that we are to be bruising Satan's head, right? Under our feet. So, <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you, you, hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead, Alive and dead, right? Alive on the right-hand side in Christ, dead on the left hand in Adam, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, <clears throat> according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now, when is now, now is when Paul wrote, and now too, but it started, it was back then also, in Ephesians, after the resurrection, isn't that right? which now works in the children of disobedience. So if that same spirit was working in the children of disobedience then, it's still working in the children of disobedience today. So, <clears throat> among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle, is what the Greek word means, in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Notice, we were children of wrath. So you could still be filling out this whole list right here. Children of wrath, now we're what? Now we're not. We're children of God. Isn't that right? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So as good as it can be right now, in the ages to come, it's going to be even better. Isn't that right? Now that does not mean that it has to be awful now so it can be good then. It's good now. We've been redeemed now. We've been saved now. We've been pulled out of the miry clay and our feet have been put on the rock to stay. Isn't that right? <clears throat> so it doesn't have to be bad and doom and gloom now. I'm not saying everything's going to be perfect. I'm not saying you're not going to have storms. I'm just saying that you will make it through the storm if you have made your house built on the rock of Jesus' words by doing what he said. Amen? Now, all right, now let's look at this. He says here <clears throat> in uh, verse, where were we at? Yeah. Hath raised us together, uh, let's go down to verse 8. There it is. 
For by grace are you saved through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Now notice, lest any man should boast. In other words, you didn't work your way there. It was by grace you got in. And once you got in, you worked accordingly. You had corresponding actions that matched what you were saying, right? Matched what you're believing. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So there are good works that God has foreordained that every believer should be walking in. Amen? Now, your good works can be acts of kindness. It can be all kinds of acts. But if some of your good works walk past you and you don't even see them. Some of them walk past you and have needs. Some of them walk past you, and, and you can see they have needs, but you don't reach out to them. Those were, some of those were good works that were foreordained that you should walk in, but you still have to walk in them. All right? Now, over 130 scriptures concerning what we have in Christ are in the New Testament. Over 130, okay? You can look them up. Actually, in the, um, in the New Man, we cover every one of them. Every one of them. They're all listed in there. And it's any scripture that has in Christ, in him, in whom, by whom, for, for whom. All these, they, these are all scriptures that have to do with something that we have. So you can go through and look them up you can take the New Man Manual. Like I said, they're all listed in there in uh, Session 6 and Session 12, Session 18. We actually have them listed. And you can go through every one of these and we'll show you how to actually incorporate them. Now, here's how you do it, okay? First off, you have to learn and know, okay? Then you have to believe and speak. Then you have to act and do, Right? which means what? Obedience. So this is the key. So first you have to learn. This is the process. You have to learn, and then you have to know. How do you know? You do, now listen, when you're learning, you don't know. You're learning about, but once you begin to speak and say and act and do, then you know. So you have to learn and know. You have to believe and speak because we believe, therefore we speak, right? Having the same spirit of faith. Spirit of faith believes and speaks, right? 1 Corinthians 4, 13. What we have in Christ, okay? <clears throat> and then you have to obey. Because as he is, so are we in this world. That's 1 John 4 and 17. Now, remember, and I, I said this earlier, but you have to understand the way, listen, you don't get, okay, you don't get away from this and in here by just reading the Bible or even just agreeing. Yep, that's true. Yes, oh, that's wonderful. That's, here's my promise. You get your little promise out of your promise box. Here's your promise. It's like Christian fortune cookie. You know, you pull it out, and here's what it says about you. And you oh, 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 I got a good one today. Oh, this is good. No. Okay, you have to realize you got out of here when you got born again. You were translated to here. Now, this is your spirit, okay? This is positional. It's where God sees you. But over here, you can still be operating in your soul and operating here. And all of this will be sitting dormant because these two can't be functioning at the same time. You're going to do one or the other. Now, you may be, you know, over here, maybe you have life in the sense of eternal life, but over here, you know, in the, in the soul, you're still experiencing sickness or death, which means you're not experiencing life to the fullness of the abundance that he wants you to have. Amen. Does that make sense? So you can be functioning in your soul. See, this is where people get, what this has done, people have taken this, and because they don't understand that they're operating in their soul, they think that they have a generational curse. And in reality, you don't, if you're born again, you don't have a generational curse because your generation only goes back to Jesus. No, no curse in Jesus, right? Only blessing. So if you have what people see as cursing in your life, it's because you're still living in your soul. It's not a generational curse. You don't have to go break anything. You have to go in and renounce anything. You have to change and quit living this. You have to choose not to believe this. You, know, or not, you have to choose not to walk in doubt and unbelief of this. You have to choose to believe this and quit walking in this 
and you have to decide to renew your mind to the Word of God, and then you start acting like it's true, you start talking like it's true, and it becomes, now understand, it's true the whole time in your spirit, but then it becomes true in your soul, and it becomes true in your body, and that's whenever your soul gets saved. See, a lot of times we say, well, we're going to go soul saving. No, actually, you're going to go spirit saving, right? Because the soul, they're going to have to do themselves to renew their mind. But your soul is saved to the degree that your mind is renewed to the Word of God, and your mind is renewed to the Word of God to the degree that the Bible dictates your daily action. You might want to write that down or get the recording, because I don't know if I can say it again. Okay? Now, <clears throat> but as I said earlier today, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The Bible is very clear. Jesus said there's going to be a lot of people. Basically, he said, there's a lot of people seeking life. And he said, but they can't find it. Do you get that? People seeking life and cannot find it. And they, because they're on the broad path and not the narrow path. See, people think that they're going to dictate to God the conditions by which they serve him. And you can't do that. You have to find out what is the path of life and walk in it. And when you do, everything you do is blessed. But see, if you walk in the path, in the broad path that leads to destruction, then you may have some blessings here and there miraculously, but you're not going to walk in the blessings and, you're gonna, and it's not going to be the way God intended you to live. Does this make sense? Yes. So how do you do that? You find out what the, what the Bible says about what you have in Christ you begin to agree with it, then you start to act like it, and usually when you act like it, you have to start. Okay. The Bible is very clear. God is not mocked. Isn't that right? Man's going to what? reap what he has sown. Isn't that whatever man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Now, God gave before we sowed. He gave, right? But, and we received without necessarily sowing, technically, right? So the grace of God overrode that principle, if you want to say it that way. But you have to understand that in that, now that we're in, now we can start to sow correctly. And usually, if you're going to receive, you sow first, right? But you have to have something to sow with. What God gives you to sow with, that's his blessing and then you sow that, and then you reap more of it. So usually, if you're going to have these things in your life, it's going to, okay, if you, if you want these things in your life, it's probably because your life doesn't look like you have these things. Does that make sense? So if you want them, it means you're going to have to start where you are with what you have, and you're going to have to do whatever it is here, right? If you want healing, you got to give healing. So it means, well, but I'm sick. I'm there. Well, then that's definitely sowing and reaping. You definitely want to sow some healing if you're sick, man. right? Because then you'll receive healing. <clears throat> now, I say, man, I, it's so funny. I hear people all the time. And you know, if I won the lottery, <laughs> I'd tithe. I'm like, okay, that just doesn't even go together. But anyway, <clears throat> it's funny. Well, you know, if God, if I had a million dollars, you know, I, I would give you 10%. No, you're lying. If you don't give him a dollar when you have ten dollars, you won't give him, you know, a hundred thousand if you want a million. You won't do it, right? Because if you find it hard to give up the dollar, you're gonna find it real hard to give up a hundred thousand, right? Why? Because you gotta be faithful in little before you be faithful in much. Amen. The good thing is, usually you can start with a lower amount. And it may feel like the same. See, that's the beauty of even like tithing and things like that. A lot of people. It's amazing. Listen, people write me all the time. Uh, give me scriptures that shows where tithing is a law. I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of them under the Old Testament. A whole bunch of them. It is a law. And I said, but if you need a law, you're not saved. <laughs> See, the law couldn't get you saved. And yet you're trying to go back under the law right. to, to make it. What you, what you want to do is you want me to not be able to prove to you you should tithe. Right? right? And Why? Because you're selfish. And you don't, and stingy, and you don't want to give it up, and that's your, and that's fine, that's good, you know, because we don't pressure anybody. Offerings already been received, so there's no <laughs> offering, right? Just so you know, right? But I'm just trying to to tell you that <clears throat> when people say that, they go, show this, do that. Okay, if you need a law, okay, because tithing was under the law, but there are scriptures. Now understand, <clears throat> it's understand it. Tithing 
the principle of tithing is the perfect giving system because it's percentage, right? So everybody might not give the same amount, but they can, it, you know, not the same uh, giving or same amount, but it is the same sacrifice because everybody gives 10% if that's where you're at. Now, understand too <clears throat> that under the law, you only had to give 10%. In the New Testament, we have to give him our life, which means, I don't know if you know or not, but your life includes your wallet and your checkbook, okay? So everybody's like, well, it's so much easier. And they're just, oh, no, not really. <laughs> you know, it's, Jesus didn't make things all that much easier, all right? He put more restrictions on there. So based on not just what you do, but even how your, your motives behind it. But all I'm saying is that many times when you start, you have to start while you're in the negative. And as you sow, then you begin to reap more. Yeah. And that's the way it works. It works across the board. It works in everything. I don't care what it is. If you don't have much food at home, man, find somebody and feed them. And watch what happens. When we first started years ago, <clears throat> and I'll finish with this. When we first started, I think it was started when we launched out, put it that way. We'd been studying, listening up to that point. But it was the summer of 1980. We went to Tulsa. We had no way to get there. We had no, I mean, nothing. And there was a, a family over in Garland, didn't know us. We had never met them. But we had been confessing. We were going to Tulsa for a camp meeting. And somehow they heard about it and called us. And we, I, I had lost my job at the water plant. We had nothing. We had two children, both in diapers, and we had nothing. And that's whenever many of you have heard me tell the story about when I rode the bicycle over and put money in the offering at a church over in Farmer's Branch. And then on the way back, crossed uh, Coit and Beltline and found exactly the amount I was believing for, $300. Exactly that in the middle of the road, in the middle of the intersection. If you hadn't heard the story, uh, you can probably find it on the internet or something, but I, I could tell it another time. But God met our needs. And then all I had was a bicycle. My van, I had a van, and the van broke down. And it was such a piece of junk that I just left it. And, and they towed it eventually. So basically all I had was a 10-speed bicycle. 1980, I was 21. That's not good when you got a wife, two kids. One has a serious medical problem that requires machines and all this kind of stuff. And you got nothing. You lost your job. Every, and there's no job in the town I was in. There was no jobs. But we were believing God. And I'm telling you, we confessed. We're going to camp meeting. And we said it and said it and said it. Somebody would ask us, so what are you, you going to be doing? And said, oh, we're going to camp meeting. And so we'd talk about it. And somehow these people heard it, and they called us up and said, uh, and asked us, do you have, we heard you're going to camp meeting. Yeah, we're going to camp meeting, uh, Tulsa, yep. Uh, <clears throat> do, you, do you have uh, transportation up there? Now remember, I didn't have transportation, but I had believed that I had received. Right. So I couldn't say I didn't have it. Do you get it? I had to, I, because I had to say what my confession was, I could not negate my confession, Right? And so uh, I answered in a truly uh, faith camp way, okay? And I said, yes, bless God, I believe I do. Well, what was I doing? That was faith talk for, I hope you understand, I'm not sitting in my transportation, but uh, I'm believing that I received it, right? That was just, it's faith talk, right? And so the person got real quiet, and then all of a sudden they go, oh, Oh, and I'm like, they got it. They got it. Okay, they got it. Because okay. I told God I would never ask, you know. But, and then, and they said, well, we have a, a uh, Suburban, and we have a 32-foot travel camper that we want to let you use to go to Tulsa. I'd never met them. I'm 21 years old. And they called me, and, and they said, can you come over and get it? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be there. So now, I don't know who had more faith. Me or them, because when I got there, here's a 21-year-old kid riding up on a 10-speed to their front door that's going to drive off in their Suburban and their camper. I think they had great faith. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> and so, and when I got in and we started up, it was empty, and I had no money to put gas in it. And the guy looked at me and goes, oh, my son was supposed to take it to get fill it up, and he forgot. Let's run down here, and I'll fill it up on your way out. And I'm like... All right, we can do that. So, but we ended up going to Tulsa, and we had no place to park. So there was a big 
park area, uh, not a parking area, but a park uh, where basically all the homeless people slept. And it was right directly across from the Civic Center, which is where the camp meeting was held. And so we pull up in there, and there wasn't anywhere else to park anyway. And so here we are with this big suburban, this big camper right in the park. And we're there, and we get there, and within a day, we're out of everything. We have no food, no money, nothing. And we had had some money along the way, a little bit here and there. We got there, had nothing. We went to the grocery store and with what we did have left, and we bought some food and uh, diapers for the babies and stuff, but that ran out real quick. But now when we started cooking, now we were eating cheap. We're talking hot dogs, right? I mean, that's what, cheap. I, thank God those days are gone. Anyway, <laughs> I work at Oscar Mayer. I do not eat hot dogs, I'll just tell you. It ruined me. I will not eat a hot dog. Generally speaking, I will not eat a hot dog. But, and it's kind of hard sometimes to order a chili dog with no wiener. Anyway, um, they look at you strange. But... So we get there, and we run out of food. But Well, we, we have the food at the beginning. We're starting to cook, and all the homeless people came up because they see us cooking. We can't turn them away because, I, I mean, I'm believing what the Bible said. I, I was just 21 years old, just foolish enough to believe what God said is exactly what he meant, and we started doing it. And they would come up, and we fed them. when We ran out of hot dogs real quick. And so we go, me and my wife, we go back into the little camper, we have our babies there. We have no diapers, no food, nothing, no money. And we, you know, that's the time when you start to get that, okay, you know, your heart starts to flutter and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, all right. And so we grab hands and we pray. Father, you brought us this far. You gave us this. You did this. We fed. We have, we have need. We need this. We need this. We need this. And we thank you for it. We believe we receive in Jesus. We were following the formula that we had been taught, right? right? right. While we were praying, on the camper. So I opened the door, and there's these two little ladies there with all these sacks. And they said, uh, we saw you yesterday at the camp meeting. You are here for the camp meeting, right? And we, yeah. And when we went to the grocery store, the Lord said and told us what to buy for you. And so we started emptying this stuff out. Now, two things. We had two children, different ages, different size diapers, and they bought the exact right size diapers. They, which most of you know, I have unusual eating habits, right? <laughs> My wife says I eat like a toddler. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I, I eat simple, right? Without any of the pizzazz, well, you know, the other stuff. <laughs> so, and I don't know how you can get it wrong, but people do all the time. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Okay, so... I start pulling, well, we start emptying these sacks, and the food I eat, right? They didn't know how I ate, but the food I ate was in there. And the food that my wife and my children ate was in there, right? That's what my wife always says. She has to cook two meals anytime she cooks. <laughs> I just eat simple. Anyway, but be, I firmly believe that the reason those two ladies knew what to get was because while, because they were at the store while we were feeding the homeless and while we were sowing, we didn't know it, but they were reaping for us to bring our reaping. Now, that's the grace and mercy of God. Amen. And we had money and we had food uh, to carry us through. And, and then we were in the camp meeting and they made a big announcement. If you're parked in the park, the police are towing all the cars in the park. So here we go out there, and thank God, ours was the largest thing in the park and kind of two pieces. So they had to get a special truck, and they couldn't tow it. So we got to it before they towed it. Other cars were being towed left and right, but they couldn't tow us because we were too big, and we had two pieces, basically. And so we got over there and got it. But then as we were leaving, or at the end of that, there was a couple that walked up to us from Indiana, gave us their name and said, we have to go back, but we rented this hotel room, but we have to go back early. We want to know if y'all want it. So they put us in a hotel room and we got to spend the rest of the camp meeting in the hotel room and we had a place to park our camper in the parking lot at the hotel. And so we had that. And, well, I could go on and on. But those people also, I mean, they even gave us some cash. And listen, we never told a single person what we needed, 
or that we needed anything. And we didn't dress like we needed anything. We dressed with the best we had, and we dressed in a way that and we just didn't tell people. We told God. Why? Because this stuff is either real or it's not. God meant what he said or it's not. And we have proven it and we have seen it. And I'm telling you, it's, it doesn't work for me because I'm a preacher. There's lots of preachers it ain't working for. Why? Because they ain't doing it. They would rather beg. They would rather, you know, put out some type of gimmick or something. But I'm telling you, he says to let your request be made known to God. Amen? To your heavenly Father. And I'm telling you, we have proven it. And to this day, it is one of the principles that we operate by. We never tell people what we need or even really what the ministry needs. I mean, I don't know if y'all know that or not, but we, you don't see things on, even on the website, you know, help, this is what we need and this kind of stuff. We don't do it. Now, I have done it for other ministries and other people, but not for us. Why? Because I had to know that God would meet my needs and that he heard. And Because if you tell other people, you don't know if it's just sympathy. And maybe that, does, maybe that doesn't matter to you if it's just sympathy. But for me, I have to know this is God. Because if my faith can't bring it in, then I can't do what I'm supposed to be doing by faith. And, I won't, and, and that's what happens. If people don't know how to trust God, then they'll end up begging or something else. And when that happens, usually the money is misspent because it wasn't their faith that brought the money in. But when your faith brings the money in, you know it's God's. Amen? So I'm, I'm telling you, these are, these are some basic principles I've learned. But this is how you learn to do this, and you, you bring, you have to identify with him in every area of your life to have his nature and his character and his provision in your life. Amen? Did this help you? Amen? All right, okay, well.